Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar, and Happy New Year 2024. So we're starting a new series on heights and diophantine geometry, and our first speaker for this series is Hector Pasten, and he's speaking about a criterion for algebraic degeneracy of integral points. Hector, Thank is you very right? much. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So please go ahead. Is it all right if we record this talk? Of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, of course, and course. if you have questions, feel free to uh, either ask them verbally or put them in the chat. Okay, Hector, please go ahead. Thank you. Well, thanks for the invitation and and thank you for the introduction. Also, I'm really happy to to have this opportunity to to share a little bit of math here. So the topic of the talk is some criteria to to tell whether integral points or uh, on, on varieties are algebraically degenerate, you can think about this question in more classical terms. Like uh, if you have a Diophantine equation and you're trying to find the integral solutions, is it the case that these integral solutions are parameterized by fewer variables? That's more or less what you're trying to do here. And uh, this particular project is joint work with uh, Natalia garcia Fritz, something we, we started a couple of years ago, very slowly. And then finally it was written up uh, recently in 2023. So let me start with uh, some assumptions that we will keep during the talk. Uh, I'm going to restrict my attention to the most classical setting. So varieties, I, I always assume varieties are irreducible. Some authors allow varieties to be reducible, but uh, I'm with the, with the usual assumption here. Uh, my varieties are considered over the rational numbers because I have in mind Diophantine equations. And integrality will be respect to the usual integers. So in particular, I will not discuss uh, S integers or number fields, just Q and Z, that's all. So uh, the theorem of Siegel that I'm talking about here is the following one from uh, the 20s. Let C be a smooth projective curve of certain genus G. Uh, let D be a non-zero uh, reduced effective divisor. Okay. You can think about D as a bunch of points in the curve, a bunch of points. If the degree of the canonical divisor plus this divisor D is bigger than zero, then every set of D integral points is finite. So the condition on the degree may be, may be a little obscure, but let me remark that the degree of the, of the canonical divisor is 2g minus 2. So the condition is that 2g minus 2 plus the number of points in this divisor d is positive. If that's still confusing, uh, you can just write up the cases. If the curve is rational, if the curve is a genus zero curve, you require the divisor D to have at least three points. If the curve has positive genus, then it's enough for the divisor D to have at least one point, geometric point, I mean. Okay? So under these conditions, the integral points with respect to the divisor D are going to be only finitely many. Now, you may notice that there is something funny going on here. I say, Every set of the integral points is finite, but you may have in mind the notion of integral point, like a point with integral coordinates. So I will clarify this in a moment. But if you have in mind a point with integral coordinates, that's perfectly fine. That's included in this more general notion of, the, uh, of a set of the integral points. So about the proof, I'm not going to prove it here, but uh, I can say something. Uh, Siegel prove this uh, using his Diophantine approximation result, which is, of course, stronger than Liouville's theorem, but weaker than Roth theorem, uh, is a classical one about how rational numbers can approximate an algebraic number. And he used this result uh, together with uh, the theory of abelian varieties. So basically, when your curve has positive genus, you can map it to the Jacobian and use uh, et al covers to, to somehow improve certain diaphantine inequalities. Uh, all right. Good. Uh, I did something here. Yeah. Good. So, uh, 
sorry, I accidentally opened the chat. Okay, there it is. Good. So uh, I should say that before Siegel, Runch uh, proved some special cases of this theorem, in the sense that for some curves, Runge managed to, to prove the, the finiteness of, of integral points without using Diefenten approximation, without using uh, abelian varieties in a more elementary way. We will get to this point later. Uh, this was effective. Siegel's theorem, as far as we know today, is not effective yet. Okay, it's not effective yet. But uh, but uh, Siegel's, uh, but Runge theorem, which is more elementary than, C than Siegel's theorem, in fact, can lead to the determination of the integral points when it is applicable. But uh, on the on the bad part of the story, uh, it does not work for general number fields, and it does not work for S integers. Corvalli and Sanier found a shorter proof of uh, Siegel's theorem using the schmidt sass space theorem. Now, uh, you know, it's up to you to tell whether or not this proof is simple or simpler, sorry, because uh, it uses heavy machinery. The, the Schmidt subspace theorem is a very deep extension of Roth theorem in Diefenten approximation. But after you have it, uh, the proof itself is very simple and doesn't even need abelian varieties. And the good thing about uh, the argument of Corvalli and Sanier is that uh, it can be generalized to higher dimensional varieties, not only curves. And there are many results in the literature about how to do this. Let me just quote one of them by Aaron Levin. Uh, you take, a, a, again, here I'm, I'm saying this over Q, but uh, this theorem of Levin works for, uh, for number fields in general, okay? So you take a variety, smooth projective, well, smooth projective surface over Q, and you take four irreducible, reduced effective divisors, okay? I should say somewhere non-zero, sorry. Non-zero, okay? And uh, with the condition that not three of them meet at the same point, okay? If each of the divisors is ample, then uh, you can conclude that the integral points are only finitely many. Good. So it's something like uh, Siegel's theorem, but for surfaces. That's very impressive, really, really impressive. Now, what to expect in general? And there is this conjecture. Uh, some people call it the lang voita conjecture. Some people call it the integral von Bieri-Lang conjecture. I ask, I ask uh, von Bieri, and he says, I only made a conjecture like this for surfaces, not in general. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, but uh, I will go with the name von bieri lang voita conjecture. And it says that if you have a smooth projective variety of whatever dimension over Q, and you take an uh, effective reduce normal crossings divisor on X, then uh, what can you tell? Well, if the canonical divisor plus D is big, if you don't know what big means, think about ample, okay? Just ample. It's big. Then every set of D integral points on X is going to be Sadisky degenerate meaning that when you take the Sadisky closure, you get something lower dimensional. They are not everywhere, to so I'll say. So what's the slogan? Just to remember, because the statement itself will be a little complicated. There's, the slogan is that if the divisor D is sufficiently positive, meaning close to ample or, uh, well, in the sense that the canonical plus D is B, but uh, yeah, as I said before, big and ample are kind of related notions, then uh, that should imply I'll write the generacy of the integral points. Now, you may notice that here, I did not assume that D is non-zero. And that's on purpose. This is not a mistake. Because when D is equal to zero, uh, well, let's see what's going on here. If D is equal to zero, well, that's allowed here. These conditions are satisfied. Now, the other condition, canonical plus D is big, is reduced to the condition that the canonical divisor is D, and this has a name. It means that the variety is of general type. And then the, con the conclusion is that every set of D integral points is a risky degenerate. But uh, what are the zero 
integral points with the zero divisor. Uh, well, uh, they are just rational points. There is no integrality condition at all. So um, when d is equal to zero, we get uh, the conjecture that uh, rational points in a variety of general type should be algebraically degenerate. And now, naturally, this includes Siegel's theorem. And uh, this also includes theorems of partings on subvarieties of abelian varieties. Uh, so just to give you an idea of how deep this open problem is. Now, integrality. I need to clarify what do I mean by integrality. Now, the classical notion of integrality is that if you have a Diophantine equation, an integral solution is a solution with all the coordinates being integers, naturally, right? But when you have an abstract algebraic variety uh, and you want to consider not the divisor at infinity, but whatever divisor, well, in that, in that case, you need some more abstract definition of integrality. And this is what, what I'm going to, to tell you now. You take a smooth projective variety and be a reduced effective divisor, possibly zero, okay, on the variety. I'm going to clarify the meaning of integrality uh, for rational points using heights. So attached to every divisor on the variety, there is a height function. Uh, I will give you an example in a moment. Uh, this height function is a measure of the complexity of the rational point. In many cases, it satisfies a finiteness property. To be precise, when the divisor D is ample, you have something called the Northcott property. If you bound the height coming from an ample divisor, you are left only with finally many rational points. So in, in practice, it's like, uh, uh, well, in the simplest case, what is the height of a rational number? The height of a rational number, you just take the maximum between absolute value of the numerator and the denominator, and take the logarithm of that. So naturally, if you bound this height, you are left with only finally many possibilities for the numerator and the denominator. Therefore, you get only finally many rational numbers. Well, something like this is going on in general with respect to heights coming from divisors. And this is well-defined only up to a bounded error term just because of the construction. There are techniques to get a uniquely defined height in some situations, but I'm not going to to go into that. Well, there is also uh, the notion of vial functions. I will only use the Archimedean one, the one coming from the usual absolute value. Some people call this also proximity function because uh, I will explain why, but there is some notion of how close you are to a divisor, and this is measuring precisely that. And this Archimedean uh, veil function or proximity function uh, I will not give you the definition because it's a little bit technical, but here is how you should think about it. When the divisor is reduced and effective, you can take this lambda roughly as the logarithm of one over the distance of your rational point to the divisor. And you put a one here so that you don't need to, to worry about negative values here. So uh, how to read this? The closer your rational point is to the divisor, the larger this lambda is. So in that sense, it's called proximity because when the distance is small, you say the proximity is large. You're very close to the, to the target. So yeah, sometimes when, when you see this by the first time, you may get confused that, uh, well, if you are close, the distance is small. Sure, the distance is small, but the proximity is big. So and that's what this lambda is trying to capture. Now, here finally is uh, the definition of integrality. Uh, you take a smooth projective variety over Q and a reduced effective divisor. A set of rational points, the set itself is called the integral if you have the following equality as your rational point varies in the set. And the equality says that the height with respect to the divisor, the complexity with respect to the divisor equals the distance, sorry, equals the proximity to the divisor up to a bounded error term because these things are not uniquely defined. There is always this bounded error term floating around. 
Now, some observations here uh, for effective divisors. We always have, uh, for effective divisors, we always have that the proximity is bounded by the height and it is positive. So somehow when the proximity is maximal, then the, the points are, are integral. And uh, the height and the proximity are linear on the divisor. So if you take the sum of divisors, then you get the sum of the heights and the sum of the proximity function. You only need to be careful about the locus of the divisor. Your rational points cannot be there, but other than this, uh, they respect addition. Okay, so finally, here's a concrete example to try to understand this abstract definition of integrality. You take uh, the projective line, and D is going to be the point at infinity. Now, what you get in the complement of V is the affine line A1. Just take the projective line and delete the point at infinity. Now, in the affine line, you take the rational points, which is Q, and inside of the rational points, you have the integers. So whatever my previous definition was, it should tell me that the integers are integral points. If it doesn't do that, it's not the right definition, okay? So let's, let's, let's check this. So the condition in the definition, the abstract definition of integrality is that I should have this equality. I forgot to write the plus O1 here, but there is some bounded there or something. I should have this equality, that the height is equal to the proximity to the divisor. Now, keep in mind that the variety X is P1 and the divisor is the point at infinity. So the height is something we already discussed. You write your rational number as a fraction, and then the height is the logarithm of the maximum of numerator and denominator in absolute value. So that, that's already covered, we, we know this. However, what is the proximity? The proximity should be measuring logarithmically in a logarithmic scale, it should be measuring how close you are to infinity. And uh, so what does it mean to be close to infinity in the projected line? It means that in absolute value, the number is large. And when you do the computations, when you do the computations, it turns out you can come up with a very explicit uh, formula for the proximity function in this case, which is just the logarithm of the maximum between one and the absolute value of X, the usual absolute value. So uh, yeah, this should not be a surprise because when the point X is close to infinity, uh, you expect the proximity to be large, but all these numbers are in a logarithmic scale. So. Yeah, you, you should expect to see something like this. So the previous condition height equals proximity in our case gets translated to the maximum of numerator and denominator in absolute value, <laughs> excuse me, should be equal to the maximum of one and the absolute value of the fraction. Now you look at this condition and you ask yourself, what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, it means that B is equal to plus or minus one. That's what it means. And when B is, because A and B are exactly as before, they are co-prime integers. So if B is equal to plus or minus one, it means that my fraction was an integer. So yeah, so somehow magically, this abstract definition of height equals proximity managed to capture the classical notion of integrality, at least in the affine line. My claim is that uh, whatever sensible notion of integrality you can come up with, uh, this abstract definition also captures that. So something you may try, if you have an ample divisor, some multiple will be very ample, it will produce an embedding into projective space and this divisor well, if it is effective, you can you can think about the divisor as the divisor at infinity. And then integrality should be something like uh, the coordinates in this embedding are integers. Well, that set of points is also integral with respect to this definition. All right. So let's go back to Runge theorem. Uh, 
from, well, this is a pretty old theorem. You take X, a smooth projected curve over Q, and D, a uh, reduced effective divisor on X. If D is not irreducible over Q, if when you look at the divisor, which is a bunch of, ge geometrically, it's just a bunch of points, but over Q, there may be some Galois orbits. So if there is more than one Galois orbit in this D, then every set of D integral points is going to be finite. So let me give you an example, because this may look a little abstract, uh, the integral points and divisors and so forth, but uh, you can make this very concrete with equations. Take F, uh, square free monic uh, polynomial of degree at least two, and consider the following uh, super elliptic curve, y to the n is equal to f of x. Now be careful, this n here is the same n of the degree of the polynomial. So here you have a super elliptic curve. And well, Siegel's theorem will tell you that you have only finally many integral points, but you don't need Siegel's theorem here. Runch is enough because here you can compute the divisor at infinity, which is given by, uh, is given by this equation, y to the n minus x to the n. The highest degree part will give you the divisor at infinity. And this equation over q is reducible. You can, you can factor this equation over q. And therefore, you can apply Wunsch theorem. And you get finally many integral solutions. So there are many situations where you can apply Wunsch. Uh, yeah. So let me prove it. This is not the original proof. This is a modern proof, but uh, but the essential idea is the same. <laughs> Excuse me. I was sick the last few days, so I may be coughing uh, a little bit. Uh, good. So, uh, well, D can be decomposed as D1 plus D2 with DJ's non-zero, but a non-zero effective divisor on a curve is a positive divisor is going to be ample by Riemann rock So multiple is going to produce uh, an embedding. And so these divisors necessarily are ample if they are non-zero. They are non-zero because by assumption, we can decompose D. It's not irreducible. Now for a point in the set of integral points, we have this equation uh, because we have integrality, right? Integrality with respect to D is integrality with respect to D1 and D2. And therefore, when you add the heights, you should get the addition of the proximity functions up to a bounded error term. This was our abstract definition of integrality that captures the classical definition with respect to integral coordinates. And here comes the key observation, the key observation. The point X cannot be close to both D1 and D2. What does it mean? Well, imagine your curve is a projected curve. You take these two divisors, D1 and D2, they are just a bunch of algebraic points, but they are different. So there is going to be some non-trivial distance between them. And your rational points, as it varies, it will get close to one set of points or the other one. It cannot tend to the, in the limit, it cannot tend to both of them at the same time, okay? So the point X, and that's what I mean, it cannot be too close to both divisors. So, well, by the sake of contradiction, suppose that the set of integral points is infinite. So uh, you can take a subsequence that converges to one or the other, but not to both. In particular, you can take a subsequence that stays away from one of the two divisors. And I choose this divisor to be D2. This is just notation. So my sequence will stay away from D2 for infinitely many points X. And therefore, uh, the addition of the heights is equal to the proximity to D1 for this rational points X the proximity to D1 plus something bounded because the proximity to D2 does not contribute. And now remember that for some, that for effective divisors, the proximity is bounded by the height. And I get this equation. Aha, now I can cancel this height. 
the height with respect to V1. I can cancel it. And I'm left with this with this equation that uh, a bound, actually a bound, that the height with respect to V2 is bounded. And this is weird, right? Uh, because if I bound the height and D2 was ample, remember that. If I bound an ample height, I'm left with only finally many rational points. That's the North Code property. So uh, it doesn't work. Good. This is the contradiction we were trying to look for. So yeah, so this is just a reminder of what is the North Code property. Good. So for me, it's very important that this particular argument, although it's rather short, it could be confusing. So if there is any question here, please feel free to ask. Any questions? That sounds good. OK, excellent. I will continue. Good. So good. Let's reflect on this. The key observation is that the point cannot be close to both divisors. That's a key observation. Everything else was just formal computations with heights and proximity functions. Okay. So here's where the mathematics happened. So Levin uh, realized this and managed to extend this idea to higher dimensions. Okay. So uh, under the assumption that the divisor decomposes in enough divisors, he could play this game. Now, what was the key assumption is that uh, you have uh, n plus one divisors when n is the dimension of x, and that uh, not all the divisors go through the same point. And this is something you can expect because, for instance, in a surface, that's dimension two, if you have three divisors in a surface and they are general enough, uh, they don't meet at the same point. So this is a reasonable assumption. And of course, you need to assume some positivity condition, like the divisors are ample or big or something like that, so that you you can apply the North Code property at the end of the argument. But the, the the point is that here I have a little picture here. The point is that if you have a configuration like this on a surface, three divisors, not all of them through the same point, your rational point cannot be close to the three of them, and you can find a subsequence that stays away from one of the divisors. And then you can apply the idea in Roots theorem, same computation, the same computation. So in this way, uh, Levin uh, extended Roots theorem to higher dimension. Now you may say, that's very elementary. Why would you do that? Well, because uh, first uh, it's effective. So when you can prove something along these lines, uh, you can use it actually, you can revisit the proof to, to find the rational points because you get an actual bound on the height. And when you have an actual bound on the height, you can do a brute force computation to, to find the points if the bound on the height is uh, sensible, is reasonable. That's one reason. The other reason is that it's really, really difficult to get algebraic degeneration of integral points in higher dimensional varieties. So whatever technique you can come up with is valuable. Uh, so of course, we're aiming for this. This is the final goal, the bombieri lang voita uh, conjecture. That's the final goal, but we are nowhere close to that. It's really difficult to prove uh, something here. Uh, so I can tell you more or less what we know about this conjecture. We know for we know this for sub varieties of a billion varieties by work of uh, partings after ideas of voita and bombieri. And something else we know for integral points only is uh, when uh, the divisor D has many, many components, okay? And that comes from uh, techniques using the Schmidt subspace theorem. This originated with uh, what I told you before, uh, the works of Corvage and Sanier. There is also work by Voita using, uh, using s unit equations. Uh, but uh, on the background, there is always uh, the Schmidt subspace theorem. Right. So these are basically the two settings where we can put things. Either you can map non trivially your variety to some abelian variety, or uh, your device on D has many components, and you can reduce the problem to the Schmidt subspace theorem. 
and the valuable thing in this theorem of uh, Levin is that n plus one is not that many components. So this, in many cases, this is beyond what you can prove using the Schmidt subspace theorem. Just for comparison, I mentioned before a theorem of Levin that work over general number fields, but I only stated over Q. That theorem for surfaces required uh, four divisors, four, okay? Now, if you restrict your attention just to Q, you can get away with three divisors. This is what uh, this theorem is saying. So yeah, so the idea is pretty simple, but you get kind of, kind of strong results. It's rather surprising. And what is more surprising is that nobody realized this until 2008. <laughs> That's really amazing. Okay, this is the setting as I explained before. Now, what did we do? Uh, what we did with uh, Natalia, I forgot to say that this was joint work with Natalia Garcia Fritz, what I'm going to tell you from this point on. What uh, we did with Natalia is that uh, we obtained algebraic degeneracy for devices with n components rather than n plus one. Okay. So just to get from n plus one to n leads to some complications. I will explain what's going on here. The key complication is that. If the divisors are ample, well, ample divisors meet. And it can very well happen that uh, if you have uh, just n divisors where n is the dimension of x, these divisors will meet at the point. So I have a picture here. On a surface, if you have two ample divisors, they will certainly meet. They will intersect each other. And now in this setting, your rational points can very well be close to both divisors at the same time. You may have an infinite sequence of, of rational points converging to this intersection point, and those points will be close to the two divisors. They can be integral. So this is the complication when you want to go from this setting to the other setting. Just to get from n plus one components to n components leads to this complication. So the, the key observation in Runge theorem is that the point cannot be close to both divisors. If you, if you go to higher dimensions, well, you want the points, the points to be away from at least one of the divisors. So and here is what I explained uh, in the previous picture that uh, it can happen that the divisors meet. So it can happen that your rational points is close to all of them at the same time. So you cannot play the same game. However, uh, the situation is bad, but not too bad. Uh, when you have a normal crossing assumption, your divisors, when they meet, they meet only on a finite set of algebraic points. So this is starting to look good because, sure, your rational points can converge to all of the divisors at the same time. But if that happens, they converge to certain fix algebraic points. And that's strange, okay? Uh, we have theorems to deal with this situation. We have, there is literature to theorems available to, to show that uh, on varieties that assign this and that assumption, rational points cannot approximate too well an algebraic point, like Roth theorem, for instance, in T1. So we define an invariant tau to control this phenomenon and it turns out that this invariant is strictly less than one in plenty of situations, and that's enough. If you get this invariant below one, then you can play the same game and you can prove algebraic degeneracy of integral points. So let me right away define what this invariant tau is. You take a smooth projective variety over Q. Y is a zero dimensional reduced sub scheme over Q, if you don't know what this is, well, it's just a bunch of finite Galois orbits, yeah? a bunch of algebraic points with the Galois conjugates. Okay, that, that's why. This is the, the the capital Y here, and D an effective divisor, and this number extended real number it could be infinite. This number is going to be the infimum of all the tau's 
satisfying this inequality. All the taus with the condition that the height dominates the proximity. Okay, and you want, for applications, you want tau to be smaller than one. Okay, but it's not exactly this. You want this condition, it's enough to have this condition outside a proper Sarisky closed subset. So if this condition fails, that's fine. As long as it fails in a lower dimensional uh, at the right subset. Okay, now this lower dimensional algebraic subset that controls the exceptions to the inequality can vary with the parameter tau. That's also fine. We, we don't worry about that. <clears throat> so some remarks. When y is a single rational point and the divisor b is ample, then this tau is less than or equal to one. Okay, so in general, to require tau less than one is not too far from what you get for free. And small value of tau indicates that the algebraic points in Y, because remember, Y is a finite set of algebra algebraic points. These algebraic points are poorly approximable by rational points. You cannot approximate them too well unless you are in a lower dimensional algebraic subset. Okay. So yeah, in general, uh, this is what the, the invariant tau is measuring. So yeah. So you want small value of tau to tell that the right points in Y are poorly approximable. And as I mentioned already many times, we need tau strictly less than one. And here's the main result. Is a little technical maybe, so I will give some applications later. You let X be smooth, projective variety over Q of dimension N. You take N reduced effective big divisors on X. So I need big to have some positivity assumption here, exactly like in the bombieri lang conjecture. You need some positivity assumption such that uh, the divisor is normal crossings. This is also a reasonable assumption in the von Bierdi-Lang conjecture, uh, von bierdi voita conjecture. The, the divisor is also assumed to be normal crossings. Now, uh, assume that for every component of the total intersection defined over Q, you have this inequality. I should clarify what I mean by this. The total intersection due to the normal crossings assumption, uh, due to the normal crossings assumption, the total intersection uh, is a finite set of algebraic points. Everything is defined over Q, so you have Gala orbits. This is why. This is the capital Y. And when I say uh, component, I mean one of these Gala orbits because the Galois orbit itself is going to be defined over Q, although the points may be irrational. So uh, I will assume that uh, this invariant tau is less than one for every component Y of the total intersection with respect to every one of the divisors dj. This is the assumption. Then there is a proper Sarisky closed subset so that every set of the integral points is degenerate in the sense that it's contained in Z, except perhaps for finally many points. So this, this Z does not depend on the choice of integral points. So you have algebraic degeneracy in this case. Now you may wonder how frequent is this condition uh, in nature? Okay, so is it artificial or is it often satisfied? Well, uh, we don't have a complete uh, classification of all varieties in the world, but I can give you examples, okay? So, right. So for the applications, I don't want to repeat uh, the hypothesis all the time. Uh, so let me fix some notation. X is going to be smooth projective variety over Q of dimension M. The divisors d1 up to the n are reduced effective b. And uh, the total divisor here is normal crossings. 
that's a that's a notation. So here's one application. Take the divisors in the neuron severity group. Okay, modular algebraic equivalence. Take the divisors there and let R be the rank of the group they generate in the neuron severity. By the way, uh, the divisors modulo linear equivalence, that's huge, okay, it's huge. They may have a continuous component, for instance. However, the neuron severity is finally generated. So it has some finite rank. And usually, I mean, it's really easy to come up with examples where this rank is small, even one, for instance. So, all right, so just to give you a sense of what, it, what is going on here. So let R be the rank of the group this device is generating the neuron severity. If the rank is smaller than the dimension, then the set of the integral points is satisfied degenerate. So in particular, this is, satis this is satisfied if the Picard rank, the Picard number, uh, the Picard number is the name of the rank of the neuron severity. If it's smaller than the dimension, well, the Picard number is an upper bound for R. So if it's smaller than the dimension, you will get a direct degeneration of the V integral points. So this is something that happens pretty often. But here's the idea of the proof, how you deduce this from the previous theorem. Uh, it's not so direct, okay? There's a little detour here. You let Q be the dimension of the space of regular differentials, the irregularity in classical geometry. Um, when the irregularity is zero, remember that I told you that divisors modular linear equivalence may have a continuous component. Well, this continuous component is an abelian variety, the peak zero. And this abelian variety uh, has dimension equal to Q. So when Q is equal to zero, it means that there is no continuous component and uh, the algebraic and linear equivalence coincide. They are basically the same thing. There may be some issue with the torsion, I don't remember exactly, but okay, never mind. So there is going to be an, a linear equivalence relation between the divisors, meaning that there is going to be a non-constant rational function on X whose divisor is supported on these DJs. Now, the integral sets are, are going to be mapped to rational points in P1 through this rational function, but these points are the integral and the zeros and poles of F are in D. So the image of these points are going to be zero infinity integral in P1, but the zero infinity integral points in P1 are only finite many, okay? The numerator and the denominator are bounded. So taking pre images, you get algebraic degeneration. Now, what if the irregularity is positive? Well, in this case, there is the Albanese map going to an abelian variety of dimension Q, the Albanese variety. And the Albanese map is going to be non-trivial. And since A is an abelian variety, well, we know quite a lot about Diefenten approximation in abelian varieties. And you can use this information to prove that in fact, the invariant tau is equal to zero in this case, exactly zero, and zero is less than one. So yeah, so we are good here. So this is the way you prove this. It's a little bit indirect. Uh, using the volume, uh, the volume of a divisor is basically a measure of how fast the, the, the dimension of the space of sections grows if you look at multiples of the divisor, okay? Um, right. So to say that the volume is positive is basically the definition of big divisor. So a divisor is big if the multiples of the divisor have many sections with pores controlled by the divisor. And when the divisor is sample, the volume can be computed as uh, the self-intersection, the top self-intersection of the divisor. Uh, this is basically Riemann law. So something we proved is a general bound for this parameter for this invariant tau, and the bound uh, for big divisors is this number, the nth root of little d over the volume of the divisor. Little d is the number of geometric points of y because y is zero dimensional. 
And this bound is completely general. There are no assumptions, uh, no nothing. I mean, it's just for whatever uh, zero dimensional Y and whatever divisor, B, big divisor B that you want to take, you always have this bound. And in particular, you get algebraic degeneracy as soon as this volume is large enough. And this happens quite often. Okay, I'm I'm not going to state the theorem because because of time and because I guess that you can you can see what's going to happen here. Now, sufficiently positive divisors. Uh, we have mentioned uh, big divisors, ample divisors, but not a measure of how big or how ample they are. If we quantify this, we also get our direct degeneracy of integral points. So suppose that we are dealing with dimension at least two, at least a surface. You take your divisor D with n components. Uh, assume that, uh, oh, here there should be, okay, this is actually a bad mistake. Let me fix it right now because the previous mistakes are not too bad, but this is bad. Should compile in a second. Good, there was a J missing here. Okay, so, uh, so assume that the divisor DJ is a multiple of a divisor LJ, of, uh, well, line bundle if you want, a tensor power of a line bundle LJ, with the following positivity conditions. LJ is ample globally generated and the exponent mj is at least two. So this is a very explicit measure of how big, well, in this case, how ample I need my divisors. Very explicit. This is something you can test in concrete examples. Well, uh, then integral points are algebraically degenerate again. Okay, and I should stress the fact that we are dealing with n divisors. Okay, which is the case when the divisors actually meet and divisors where n is the dimension of x. So how do you how you prove this? Well, you may be familiar with the Roth McKinnon theorem. This Roth is not Klaus Roth, this is Mike Roth, uh, the Roth McKinnon theorem, uh, which is a little technical to be stated here, but it says that if the if you have an algebraic point. And the Seshadri constant with respect to a line bundle is large, then the point is hard to approximate with rational points. Okay, that's what it says. And what is the Seshadri constant? The only thing you need to know is that it's something that comes from algebraic geometry. It's not something arithmetic. And this is why this Rod McKinnon theorem is so surprising that you can link this number, which is purely geometry in geometry to a diaphantan approximation property, which is to approximate poorly a rational point badly. Okay. Now, the positivity assumption we have here ensures that the Seshadri constant is large enough to apply the Roth McKinnon theorem. And that gives that the rate of, of approximation is bad, which means that tau is less than one. And then we can apply our theorem. So here we can quantify very explicitly how ample we need our divisors to get algebraic degeneration of integral points. Uh, here's uh, the last one I want to mention. Uh, assume that the complex points give you a, of the variety X give you a manifold with large algebraic fundamental group. I will tell you in a moment what this means, okay? If each divisor is ample, and now I don't need to measure how ample, just ample, okay? Then every set of D integral points is a risky degenerate. Uh, what, what it means, uh, what it means that uh, the algebraic fundamental group is large. It means that when you look at positive dimensional sub-varieties, you look at the algebraic fundamental group of them, map this algebraic fundamental group to the algebraic fundamental group of the ambient variety, the image has to be infinite every single time, okay, for positive dimensional sub-varieties. In particular, 
the variety itself has to be tested for this criterion. So the variety itself should have infinite fundamental group, algebraic fundamental group. So examples of this, positive dimensional abelian varieties, for instance, or something more exotic could be compact ball quotients like uh, fake projected planes, for instance. Uh, all right. So yeah, in this generality, any any variety of a Q with large algebraic fundamental group will give you algebraic degeneracy of integral points, provided that uh, the divisors are ample and you have as many divisors as the dimension of uh, X. Okay, why is this? Well, there is work by Servo and Servo uh, on the, or maybe this is pronounced Cervo, I'm not sure, on the eta Seshadri constant, which is same Seshadri constant produced by algebraic geometry, but computed when you go to etal covers, okay? And you look at the limit. The etal Seshadri constant uh, for X is going to be infinite, thanks to the assumption of large fundamental group. Then you apply the Roth McKinnon theory, machinery uh, that they have, because it's not only for Seshadri constant, they explain how to use the etal construction here, the etal covering construction. And in this case, uh, you get that uh, rational algebraic points are really, really badly approximable. Um, so you get tau equal to zero again, and this is lesson one. And we can use our main result. Okay. So this to tell you that sometimes uh, just a simple idea together with the appropriate definition can be used to put together tools developed by other people and finally get something new. And uh, I guess the moral of the story is that uh, we're running out of ideas to attack the Bombieri line void type conjecture. So anything you can say about this is very welcome in the field. Thank you. Thank you, Hector. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, let's see, are there any questions? Uh, well, maybe I could start with one. Uh, I didn't catch the definition of the large fu algebraic fundamental group. Is that a right. technical term or is that a... Yeah, it's a technical term uh, developed by Janus Kolar. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the idea is this. You take a variety. Uh, let, let's put aside the word algebraic, okay? If, if we are not familiar with the notion of algebraic fundamental group, because uh, I mean, not everyone here is a specialist in this, but uh, just think about the fundamental group. What does it mean for a manifold, for instance, to have large fundamental group? Well, you look at the fundamental group of the manifold. Well, if it's going to be called large, it better be infinite, right? Mm -hmm. Now you take a sub manifold of positive dimension. Well, you would expect this to be infinite also, to have infinite fundamental group. Well, you require more. You require that the image of this fundamental group of the sub manifold mapped to the fundamental group of the ambient manifold is infinite, the image. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what you require. So, for instance, uh, an abelian surface, an abelian surface has infinite uh, fundamental group because it's a torus and it does not contain rational curves. So the curves contained in this uh, abelian surface are going to be of genus at least one. And those guys have a uh, infinite fundamental group. And then you need to check that this infinite fundamental group when you map it to the fundamental group of the abelian surface still infinite. So that, that's a technical term, uh, large fundamental group, okay? Oh, thank you. Uh, so Hild, would you like to ask a question? I have a question. So in umbiemi lang Voita conjecture, uh, so the, basically the condition is like a log canonical bundle is positive. So if like D itself is negative, but log, but canonical bundle itself is very positive, it's still right. pretty that we have like finitely many d integral points. So, exactly. do we have, so do we have any results in the case which works? I mean, in the case that d itself is not like big or any, it does not have any positivity, but we still can say something about integral points? Well, yeah, for sub varieties of abelian varieties, 
if you look at uh, Falting's, Falting's work, well, Falting shows that for a variety of general type contained in, a, in an abelian variety, you get algebraic degeneration of rational points. However, there is another theorem in that paper, which is uh, a Diophantan approximation theorem to ample divisors. So that also gives you something for integer points. But I guess your question is about rational points, right? Uh, because if the divisor is negative, you can just forget the divisor and keep positivity of the of the canonical divisor, mm -hmm. right? So I would say that for rational points, um, unless for some local condition, you don't have any rational points at all. Uh, what we know is uh, sub varieties of abelian varieties, et al covers, okay? So if this variety may be not something you can map to abelian varieties, but uh, it has some et al cover that can be mapped to abelian varieties, okay? And uh, there is also projective or compact sub varieties of the moduli space of abelian varieties with sufficient structure, okay? But this machinery between like diophantine approximation results and uh, like this finiteness of integral points or rational points, that right. basically does not work here, right? If D itself no. is negative. Okay. No, 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 no. Like Schmidt's subspace theorem or this technique of Wunsch, uh, no, they break down when you look at rational points. They are really something about integrality with respect to a non trivial divisor. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Any other questions here? Yeah, I had a question. So um, probably it's more of a literature question, but the way that you talk about integral points working with more classical theorems like Ziegel and Runge, has anyone thought about or done uh, some sort of application of Baker's method? Do we get effective oh, yes. here? Yeah, and that's an excellent point actually. I didn't want to go into the very delicate issues of effectivity, but uh, to, 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 right. Yeah, so we go back to this. So for some curves, like for instance, uh, some hyperelliptic curves, uh, one can replace the diaphantan approximation result of Siegel to apply uh, the Diophantine approximation results that you get from ba Baker's theory of linear forms in logarithms, which is, you know, very mild improvement on uh, on uh, Liu yeah. but still, but uh, but still is uh, significant. And when you when you apply this, you get effective finiteness, but it's not sufficiently general. It only works for equation Diophantine equations of certain type. Uh, that uh, you need to describe in terms of the equation rather than abstractly in terms of the curve. I think that uh, I think that um, Bilu and collaborators have some work trying to apply linear forms in logarithms more abstractly, perhaps especially in the case of modular curves. But yes. uh, yeah, but uh, to give an abstract classification of what kind of varieties can are suitable for linear forms in logarithms. I don't think that's something actually well un understood at this point. Thank you. Okay. Well, great. Let's thank Hector again. Thank you. And the next Vantage talk is on February 9th uh, with Philip Hubberger.